Hello, and welcome back to the Student Pilot Cast, everyone. I've got another feature for you today, but this one's not from Oshkosh this time. I caught up with Nick Smith over Skype from an online private pilot ground school program that he started called Part-Time Pilot. Enjoy episode 63, Why Part-Time? Chandler Tower, Cherokee 4121 Tango is at Chandler Air Service. We have Zulu, and uh, we'd like a south departure, please. So it was a pleasure talking to Nick, and I learned a lot about not only what he's doing differently for online ground schools, but how many different effective ways people learn, and sometimes that personal touch, even online, is exactly what someone needs. By the way, Nick will give some tips on how to save some money on his program, so pay attention. This is also a video episode. If you want to watch us talk through this, you can find that in the video feed or on our new YouTube channel. Without wasting any more time, here's my discussion with Nick. Welcome back, everybody, to Student Pilot Cast. Uh, we've got another feature episode here, a little different than than audio in the cockpit. Uh, but I have the honor here to be with Nick Smith from Part Time Pilot. How you doing, Nick? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Oh, this is going to be fun. Uh, so, for those of um, those people out there, just do a a one minute introduction about what part-time pilot is. And then I've got some questions for you that go a little more personal. Okay. Sounds good. One minute. All right. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so my name's Nick Smith. Uh, part-time pilot is basically online ground training for right now. It's just private pilots. So we do online ground school and an online check ride prep program. Then we have a lot of bonus courses that kind of help pilots navigate their private pilots license that's pretty much pretty much what it is and probably get to this later but we do we try to to be different than than the most than the other online ground schools out there and really sort of have a personal touch with with the student pilots awesome thanks that was pretty yeah. good you kept it under a minute <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll definitely get into more detail later uh, but i just wanted to uh, ask you what what got you interested uh, what got Nick Smith interested in aviation? So I can remember a few things that really in, happened in my childhood that really kind of drove me to aviation. One was watching the space shuttle launch in Cocoa Beach, Florida. That was like, okay, I want to be an astronaut. That's for sure. Right. When I was like, I don't know, eight years old or something like that. Then I think I was like 12 and I, or 10 or something. And I got to go in into the cockpit and I got my wings and I was like, wow, that, you know, that's pretty cool. Even if I don't become a, a, uh, yeah, astronaut, I could be a pilot. And then I, so growing up, I was big into sports and basketball was like my main focus. And it took a lot of my brain power and, and energy. And I actually got a scholarship to play division two basketball. So that's what I did after high school for a couple of years. But I saw, and this is the third thing that sort of drove me and kind of the final thing that drove me to aviation was I saw the movie Iron Man. And I was always like good at math and good at my studies. But when I was focusing all on basketball, I kind of felt like I was sort of wasting my future. Like I wasn't going to play in the NBA. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like, I was like, am I really? Cause basketball took all my time. I was just kind of sloughing it on my, on my uh, classes and stuff. So Iron Man, just, just the Tony Stark engineering new things in aviation and all that stuff just really made me be like, I want to, you know, I want to do that. that. That sounds cool. That sounds like a great career. I'd be good at it. So I decided to transfer to the University of Washington, get my bachelor's in aerospace engineering. And then I went on to my master's at Georgia Tech in aerospace. And that, so yeah, that basically to answer your question, it was a combination of things all throughout my childhood 
And then the movie Iron Man really <laughs> sealed the deal for me. <laughs> I, I, I guess that's pretty. I, I guess that's aviation, right? I mean, he flies. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nick, are you a pilot? I am a pilot. I'm a private pilot. Awesome. And yeah. how and where and when did you learn to fly? When did you get your certificate? Yeah, so I'm originally from Seattle. So after Georgia Tech, I moved back to Seattle and worked for Boeing for a few years. And while I was at Boeing, I decided I wanted to get a private pilot because I had this, you know, like I said, I had those dreams as a kid to be a pilot, astronaut, all those things. So I got the job to pay the bills, to pay the pilot bills, and then I wanted to get my pilot's license. So I started in Seattle and then, and I actually soloed rather quickly, was progressing through it and then hit kind of the winter months of seattle with the low (laughs) the low ceilings right and cold and wet yeah yeah and burned through that five six thousand dollars that i had saved up which was not a not enough and so i started going paycheck to paycheck and then at the same time i was sort of getting sick of of the desk job and i was looking into flight test engineering roles uh something that's more hands-on with the aircraft right either flying in the aircraft or or looking at data of the aircraft and and changing things on the aircraft so i started applying to those flight test engineering jobs and i got one in san diego and so i decided to move during the middle of my flight training which really derailed it basically had to start back Mm -hmm. all over in san diego and then you know got got quickly back to to where it was but had some struggles again with weather in the summer, mm. right? It was right when I needed my solo cross country flights and they have us fly to the desert like Yuma and Palm Springs. And the problem is you're flying out of San Diego and the Marine layer, you can't get out until about 10 AM. Right. But then you have, but then you have to get to the desert by 11 AM before it's 110. <laughs> so <laughs> that was a real struggle. So I, then I went through that and then finally, finally, after about three years and twenty two thousand dollars, I finally got my private pilot oh, license. Man. So, yeah, excellent. Well, congratulations. Um, what what um, airport were you flying out of in San Diego? Gillespie Field. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so, what got you thinking about ground training and doing it a different way? Yeah, so I almost, you know, three years, $22,000, I think I had four or five instructors. It was very taxing mentally on me. If it wasn't for, you know, that I had I had a good job and, and a supportive wife that I wanted to quit a lot. And I, I, I was just thinking about it and I was thinking like if someone, you know, I had a good feel for the aircraft. All my instructors said that I got to soloing in under 10 hours. So it wasn't like, and then I had the, you know, the background, the aerospace engineer, the flight test engineer. And I thought like, if this was hard for me, like, it's no wonder that like, I think AOPA says 80% of student pilots end up never becoming a private pilot. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that figure is a little bit old, so I don't know what it is now. But I really just had an epiphany that the flight training industry was sort of failing us, right? And there's a demand for pilots at the same time. So I kind of saw an opportunity and it really just started with, I made like an ebook and an Instagram, just educating students on what not to do. Basically my, my story of flight training. So that's how it started. And then I realized that all I really had to do was take a couple exams and become a ground instructor. And then I could build my own ground school and actually, you know, monetize this. And at the same time, be that change in the industry that I thought it needed. Excellent. Um, we'll get to a little bit about um, some of your, what you see as your competitors, <clears throat> excuse me, as your competitors. Um, but what was it, what did you feel like was not being offered by, um, by the curriculum or 
the services that were already out there. I mean, you lived in San Diego, so you obviously know about the Kings, right? And um, mm-hmm. there's there's uh, some other offerings. We, we all know about Sporties and some others. Um, what was it that you were bringing to the table or that you wanted to bring to the table that was a little bit different than uh, what those more established players were doing? Yeah, so I got nothing bad to say about those guys and my competitors and Kings, like you said, they're the OG. They've been around yep. forever <laughs> and they do a great job. They know their stuff. But the one thing that I saw <clears throat> that I think is our biggest separator is that personal touch mentorship type of thing. Yep. The holding your hand from the time you go into IACRA and, and get your student pilot certificate application sorted out to, you know, preparing for your check ride and then shaking the examiner's hand. And then we have pl- future plans to go beyond that. But just that kind of guide, right? The 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 Gandalf of the <laughs> – I'm a big Lord of the Rings nerd, but, like, just that guide through your, your private pilot license. So – started with you know educating students what not to do and avoiding unnecessary costs because i really understood what i understood was that i was lucky enough to be able to pay twenty two thousand dollars and make it work but for most people that's why 80 percent of student that would be the end of the road right yeah it gets to the point maybe at 16 17 18 thousand dollars where it's like this 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 can't go on right so the biggest thing and the easiest thing that we that I could do is educate students before on what not to do to avoid those unnecessary costs and really have a plan going into it and then have that mentor where they say, okay, what, what do I do next, right? What's the best thing that I can do next? And here it is. And not to say that, that if you reached out to Kings or, or Sporties or anything, that they wouldn't have someone that, that could offer you that advice too, but that's really the forefront of our platform you've sort of built it into the program right yeah yeah exactly yeah that is, yeah. That is definitely different uh differentiator there so no. um i gotta ask um is that where the part-time pilot name came from can you explain that a little bit yeah so it's it's um i'm an engineer so it it has some logic to it and just like the keywords of pi- pilot and time right mm-hmm. so that's like you know, Google searching how much time does it take to be a pilot? The mm-hmm. part-time pilot would show up for that. But also that, like, I realized most people either they have a job, they have kids, they have a life at home, they're taking care of people, kids, whatever. Piloting is is not. It's very rare. Probably twenty percent or less of people that just can dedicate all their time or money to flight training, right? And this is this is my career. They do the ATP, and that's great, everything. But most of us. Either it's a career change, so we're working to pay for our flight training, or it's going to be a hobby that we want to do outside of work. So we really are, at least at the beginning, in, in, during that tra- training stage, we really are part-time pilots. So that's another focus of of what we do. Is and I actually I just started a podcast where I go through our audio. Our it's basically I'm calling it the audio ground school. So it's all our lessons in audio, and it's just making it more 21st century kind of more consumable for people when they're driving to work when they're on a walk things like that so that's kind of how part-time pilot came up was realizing that most of us are starting off as a part-time pilot we have other responsibilities and a place that can maybe cater more to those people and try and help them in their limited amount of time yeah that's cool and of course you don't have to convince me of the power of the audio platforms uh i think it's, yeah i think it's really powerful it has its uh it has its own important niche outside of video so yeah i'm with you on that yeah and i gotta say i i want to listen to more i kind of got hooked on yours i listened to the first three episodes of your podcast and i i love the idea i wish i would have done it when i was <laughs> going through my my training so um i'm sure a lot of people have found that helpful because you know, when you're going through those struggles that I talked about, it's nice to know that other people are also kind of going through that stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. That was one of the yeah. important things I found. I didn't know that when I started um, the podcast, but it was one of the things I found is um, there are struggles. And the more I've talked to people who be- I wasn't alone. And I thought, man, I got to make sure that people know <laughs> that people know that we all go through these struggles and these uh, doubts and 
um, you know, you, you get hung up on some aspect of flying and it's sometimes different for everybody, but, um, you know, getting, getting the landing smooth, understanding round out and flare, you know, it's, you get hung up on something, um, if not multiple things during your, tr- your primary training. And it's important for people to know that you can push through it, you know? So I'm, I'm glad you've got that mentoring going on. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know how many times I, I've had students, I've seen it on a Facebook group, whether it's ours or someone else. And they just, they say, oh my gosh, I, I had a bad day, bad landing. I'm so embarrassed. Maybe I'm not cut out to do this. And exactly. I'm just like, e- everyone has those days. That's you know? right. That's yeah, right. So, uh, that's cool. All right. So now we get a chance to t- kind of dive into the program a little bit. So you gave the okay. overview. We talked a little bit about the history and how you started. Um, how, it, what are all the different aspects? I mean, you've already mentioned a podcast, you've mentioned audio, uh, you've, you've mentioned some of your lessons and, and live things that you do, uh, mentorship. What are all the aspects of part-time pilot that one of your, uh, students would have access to? Yeah. So, uh, there's kind of the general like salesy things like, and, Actually, first, let me let me say that when I decided to make an online ground school, what I did was, excuse me, was I looked at basically what I thought was like the top five ground, online ground schools. And I listed out, sorry, I got a little hiccup. That's and okay. I listed out every, everything that all the features that they had. And then because I had started with an Instagram, I started asking the people that were following me. I was making just informational posts. And got some followers and I started asking them like, you know, what, what were the most important things for your online ground school? What did you find the most useful? And I made a list and I wanted to, cause I hate like selling. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted what I was selling to be just an easy choice. Right. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to have eventually have all the features that, you know, that a student needs and then be the best and then still be one of the lowest prices right so it was just an easy sell i didn't have to do the selling so that's kind of what i came up with one of the things i um one of the big things was lifetime access there's some online ground schools that they just offer a year and with so many people that i asked they're like well you know every two years we got to review this info it'd be nice if i didn't have to pay you know a year if i could just have this for my whole pilot career. So that was a no brainer having a community and be able to get their questions answered. So I try to be super available and we have that Facebook group community. So there's instructors, there's other students and there's other pilots on there. So you can get a wide perspective. So there's that group community of learning that we have and then also live lessons. So combination of both so that people who like the live lessons and I, I started these about three months ago and the, the people really enjoy them that they can get their questions answered and I can show them things live. But then people who want that at their own pace type of thing, they'd be able to watch the recordings and then maybe just post, you know, send me an email or post on the Facebook group and get their questions answered. So two different, I, I kind of realized, you know, some people like the one way, some people like the other. So just having both of those, and then one big one was a lot of people are big on just studying at their own pace. A lot of people say, okay, you know, I want to be a pilot, but I want to see if I can learn the ground training stuff first. And so they kind of go at their own pace, which is great. I think that's a great way to do it, especially, you know, if, you, if you're not pressed by time or anything like that. And so having the ability to sort of be mobile and study anywhere, have things you can download, print, so like... We have a lot of bonus content that you can download and study offline. We actually had a, a guy who was in the Navy, and he used all our download content for three months when he was in a submarine mm. uh, to, to p- study and pass, pass the exam. So that was a big thing for people. And then um, practice tests, that's one of the big things, like questions, practice questions. I... Um, I try not to make that the, the focal point of, of my, what I, you know, what I talk about because I don't want students to get caught up in just memorizing practice tests and answers, but we do have that. We have flashcards and a bunch of practice mm-hmm. tests because 
again, that is very helpful tool to passing the exam, but I want them to, to learn the fundamentals behind it and not just memorize things. And then uh, visual aids, so videos, and that's one thing that uh, we're, make, we're working on right now is getting actually even better on our videos. Because if I'm being honest, the one thing that I lacked at things like, you know, my competitors have is they have these really nice animated videos. Right. 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 And when I, when I was just starting out, I, I don't know if you took a look at any of my videos, but I did. They're, they're pretty rudimentary. They're very informational. But yep. so I've been working with it with an animator and we're getting some of those animations because that's a big thing for people, you know, visual learners like I am myself. So those. And yeah. Then, you know, um, I don't want to derail your train of thought, but um, the thing I felt like when I was looking at your videos was that I was talking to my CFI, you know, um, when you do your live your live streams and things like that. You've got sort of whiteboard esque type training. And um, so it kind of goes along with what you were, you know, what you were trying to start is that this, you wanted this to be personal feel one-on-one. Um, and that's kind of what it felt like. It didn't, you know, my CFI never had any fancy, you know, animations. Of course that was back in 2008, but, yeah. but um, you know, he, he didn't have any fancy animations or anything, but he would, hold a model or he would write on the, the whiteboard or, you know, something like that. And that's kind of the feel I got from your videos. I got the impression that's kind of what you were going for. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I wanted, yeah, pretty much. I mean, most of it was just because I, I didn't, you know, I didn't know how to animate videos <laughs> right, as <right>. well. <laughs> if, if I was good at that, I, I probably would have done that. And I think that, that, that is very And those helpful. things but, can yeah, be, I, can be helpful you know, like you said, for visual learners, I'm also kind of a visual learner. Um, but I, I didn't feel like it was, um, you know, missing too much either. Um, but it, it can always be helpful, especially for certain segments of your customers or your students, right. Um, to have something nice like that. Yeah. 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 So I made a ton of like visual diagrams that are still images and pictures Mm -hmm. to, for, for memory aids and stuff like that. So we do have plenty, plenty of visuals, but yeah, you're, you're totally right in that it's very helpful. So that's something we're working on. So, cool. yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. I kind of interrupted you. I think you might've had a couple more points to make about the different oh, aspects. No worries. Yeah. yeah. I just kind of wrote down a list so I wouldn't forget. Uh, one of the things is the, the FA practice questions, like answer explanations. So when students get it wrong, they don't have to right. go find it again and, and try to figure it out on their own. It says, this is why it's wrong and stuff like that. That that was a big thing that we added last year. And then I mentioned the podcast and you get your endorsement automatically through our website once you, so what we do is we have all the lessons. We have a written lesson with videos and diagrams, and then we have a quiz. And then when you get through all the lessons, then we have you do three practice tests for score. And we want to see an 80%. If you get an 80% average or better, here's your endorsement. But one other thing that we do, and this is another differentiator that I made sure that I wanted to have in, and it goes back to me saying that I didn't want students to just memorize test questions and answers yep. because I found early on that students could just whiz through and do the quizzes and then get to the practice test and they could still get above an 80%. And then they go to the real thing. And maybe the questions are a little bit different, right. which the FA loves to do, or they'd get to their check ride and they'd struggle on their check ride. Yep. So what I did was I did we do custom reports where after I go through their three practice tests and I also have them answer in their own words these like long written answers mm-hmm. so that I can see the gaps in their knowledge. So we have those on like like the six main concepts, you know, like fundamentals of flight weight and balance, density, altitude, and performance, things like that, weather, and then kind of, kind of grasp is like, okay, this person knows what they're talking about. So, and then I look at that and I look at their test scores and between the questions they got wrong on the practice test and their answer explanations, I can kind of gauge where they're, they're missing links. And so then after that, we kind of tell them, here's where I think you're, you're lacking a little bit. Here's some additional stuff. Let me know. I want you to come up with a couple questions after reviewing this for me. And I kind of give them a dialogue that we go back and forth uh, until that 
and then I give them more practice tests. So we kind of work on those gaps and we focus, you know, the uh, hyper focus on those gaps. And usually it's, you know, just one or two gaps that boost their, their right. test grade by 10, 15%. Right. So that's what we do. And and we've actually never had a person fail the written exam so far. So fingers crossed. But uh, I think that's the differentiator right there. It's because we put that extra effort in. Yeah. And you're, we're not talking about 12 students either. I mean, we're talking about several hundred, right? Yeah. Last I, last I counted, it, it was 305. Yeah. And now, so I offer a money back guarantee where if they fail, they get their money back. So I would say... 70% of the students, they, they email me and say, Hey, I passed, like, but there is 30% that I never hear from again. Oh, right. I, ass- I assume that they're <laughs> passing or they would come back for their money, sure, but sure. There, could, there could be someone out there that didn't pass and they're just too embarrassed to tell me about it. But, <laughs> but, as yeah. far as you can tell, right. As far as you can tell, right. everyone's passed. That's, right. that's amazing. And that, that sort of yeah. reading through, uh, long answers, um, to figure out where the gaps are, that is definitely not something that your competitors are doing, at least the competitors I know about. Right. And, you know, I, I understand why they don't, because it kind of breaks that automated. That's right. Give them, give it doesn't them the scale. And I, That's right. I don't have to do anything. Right. Yep. So it is extra work on my part, but Hey, that I wanted to be the difference in the, in the industry. So that's why I got to do. Right. Right. Yeah. So that does lead to the question. Um, you know, where you're heading in the future and so on. How do you scale something like that um, to be thousands instead of hundreds? Um, do, do you uh, do the same thing? Uh, do you bring on extra help? Like how, how do you scale this going forward? Yeah. So the only, the only way I see scaling that and still keeping that personal touch is, is getting some help. Right. Right. And so that's, that's my next immediate goal. I have been working with, an awesome CFI shout out to Sarah. if She's listening to this, but that's just been kind of on like, Hey, I need this to be done kind of a case by case basis. It's not anything permanent, but I hope to get to a success level where I can have her or someone permanently on. And then they could take over. And she has started to do some of those reports as a trial basis. So that's kind of the, the direction we're heading mm-hmm. so that it. um, so that we can scale that. Right. Yep. And I can, I can kind of work on the future plans, which are things like doing IFR right. commercial and going that full route for those that do want to go further and, and make it a career or just get their IFR. Yeah. Yeah. And that was obviously going to be one of my questions. Is that part of the scaling plan is to go to other ratings and certificates and so on. Um, I can't wait for your, um, for your tail dragger course. No, I'm just kidding. I was just, thinking, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's so many things that I'm just like, Oh my gosh, I need to do this. I need to do this. So, <laughs> right. Right. I mean, yeah. I, I do someday want an airplane on floats, so maybe you can help me out with that too. Or no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, okay. That's, that's super cool. So, um, it's really that personal touch. Uh, it's the understanding of the gaps, not just, um, tracking which, which, um, questions you're not getting right. Cause everybody kind of does that in an automated way and kind of points you back to where, um, you know, where you may need a little extra help. But in this case, you're, you're asking for them to explain or describe a concept in a way where as a human, you're able to help them figure out, Hey, you may not fully understand this. Let's dive into this a little bit. I think that's really, really cool and definitely different. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, and that's like like what you said. It's kind of like you're with your flight instructor, right? Exactly. You're you're in a ground session. Yeah. Exactly. So, what yeah. else is is um, uh, what else do you have on the docket for part time pilot? Um, what else are you thinking about for future plans, expansion, and so on beyond additional ratings and and more students? Yeah. So our kind of mission statement, right, is to break the mold of the flight training. I said that I had an epiphany that flight training was, was failing students and there's a need. So what are the big obstacles that are failing? And the, the number one is, you, I'm sure you can guess, is money, right? Yeah. yeah. So, and I feel like most people, they just say it is what it is. It's expensive. You just got to have the money. But I, I kind of, I want to tackle that. So, 
so far, the only way we've been able to do that is by educating what not to do, have a plan, financial plans, uh, some scholarships. We actually give a thousand dollar scholarship about every three months to our students. But mostly it's it's about finding it. It's avoiding those unnecessary costs. And then on top of that is having a good ground school so that they they get one ground school. They pass their exams on the first try and they don't have to repeat them. And the, the number one unnecessary cost is redoing things in play training, redoing lessons, redoing tests, things like that. So that's what we can do now. In the future, like I said, we have the the $1,000 scholarships. I'd like to give one of those out every month. That's my immediate goal in the next year or two, give more of those out to directly help with that money mm-hmm. problem. And that's tied into our success. You know, the, the more money we make, the more we can do that. And then the other thing I have is I have a really cool idea with helping those students that want to move on to IFR and then build hours for a commercial. And usually that path, if it's not an accelerated program, it's becoming a CFI and building hours training students, right? Mm-hmm. And so I came up with this thing. It's kind of been in a beta, but it's an affiliate program that I'm going to call like a profit sharing thing where there's other, so my competitors, they have affiliate programs like sporties that you get like $25 off on their, on their, uh, on their website, their shop. And then Kings is pretty good. I think you get like 45 bucks for every student you sign up. So I wanted mine to be obviously well beyond theirs, but also focus on helping those people earn money for for building their hours. So we give, we completely share the profit. So if they get a student that uses their link to sign up, they get half, half the sale, like Mm. they do half their work. And then, so what that does is I take over their ground training, right? So they don't have to really worry about the student's ground training. They get, you know, a hundred, $125 when their student signs up for our course. And during the time and I'm kind of going through these numbers right now, but during the time that they're building our training students, they might have 10 students. That That's 10 to 20 students. That's a thousand to $2,000 that they can earn by just having them go to part-time pilot. And then on top of that, if they just, I can teach them a few ways to help out in Facebook groups and communities mm-hmm. where if they get an additional 10 during that time, like they, 10 or 20 during that time, they can make four to $5,000 towards their flight training. So that's kind of one of the things I'm working on now, kind of educating and building that platform so that we can, we can help do that profit sharing thing for those students or those yeah students that want to be making a career. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, very creative. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Partnerships are usually key for things like this. So uh, it's a great way to go about it. So, Explain to uh, to my audience here how somebody would uh, become a student uh, in your part time pilot program. Yeah, so you can find me on Instagram. It's at part period time period pilot. Part time pilot was taken, so <laughs> <laughs> you, have, you have to add the periods in there. And you can just message me on Instagram, or I have a YouTube YouTube dot com slash part time pilot. Leave me a comment. Or the easiest way is obviously just go to website parttimepilot.com and then right up top there's online ground school. But I will give a a trick is that people who subscribe to my free content, I give them a few days to get fifty dollars off. So if they want to get even a deal, because sort of a way to kind of encourage action. Right now, I just started like a five day challenge that was really popular on new year's like everyone with their new year's resolutions like to become a pilot Mm -hmm. and so i wanted to do that again so basically in five days we tell them step by step how to go through iacra how to get you know their student pilot certificate how to meet a recommending instructor and get that solidified how to prepare so you don't have any surprises during your medical exam and schedule Mm -hmm. your, your medical exam so we do all that in five days and then for the ones that make it all the way through just sort of as like, hey, great job. Like you're serious about this. So here's here's fifty dollars off because you know, I want people who want to be in our course anyways and who are serious about it. So that's a little trick 
and I could I could provide that link for your audience if you guys want it, so that they could they could get that offer. That would be great. Yeah, and I'll I'll yeah. send it out in the show notes as well as um, uh, in the lower thirds of the video. Um, yeah, that would be that would be excellent. Um, one thing I didn't ask: fifty dollars off of what? I don't think I even asked how much the program costs. Oh yeah, sorry. So <laughs> uh, yeah, so the online ground school is two hundred bucks for lifetime access, and then that full money back guarantee. If you don't pass, I'm also like, <laughs> I don't really want to broadcast this ton, but I'm super lenient with refunds because I hate companies that like don't allow you to get a <laughs> refund. So yeah. I've never not, not given someone a refund. So if you want to come in and try it out, but it's $200, which is still on the low end uh, for our competitors that have that lifetime access. I think it's, yeah, still that's like, the um, that's like two or three hours of, um, of an instructor, you know, CFI right. doing ground. I, I mean, that is completely reasonable I and mean, it's, yeah. 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 I, I think so. And then you get $50 off. So that makes it one fifty for life. So it's kind of, like I said, I, I don't like to sell. So I just want to make it easy for people. <laughs> but what sure. I did, what I did learn is that I used to have it like a hundred dollars. And when I raised my price, more people bought because I think people in their mind, they think, Oh, there's a reason there's more value. cheaper. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there must not be as value, much value as Kings. So I got to keep it close to everything, but yeah. Right. But you get that personal touch. And I think mm -hmm. you, I think yeah. you do a lot on the Facebook group too, as, as far as the personal touch, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I try, I would like some more, some more, um, action in there. I'm always trying to, people will email me or message me on Instagram. And I'm like, post this in the Facebook group so everyone can see it, you know, right, right. but, but yeah, cause you know, I think there's, there's some studies out there with like group and classroom learning where students, it was something like when another student asks a question and that student hears the answer, like, because it's a different perspective, but it might be the same kind of question that they right. had. They learn something from the way the student asked the question, and then they learn something from the answer. So it's like one of the best ways to learn is when you kind of get have other people group asking learning like that. Kind of, yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. agreed. Um, um, you could always kind of add that in your website, right? Um, it's just not something you yeah. want to focus on. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely, so I have a learning management system and if I upgraded it, that's one of the things mm -hmm. that I could, that I could get. So it, it's probably going to be in our future for sure. Okay. Just so, Cause there are some people that don't have Facebook. And sure. Like the only reason I'm on Facebook is for our Facebook. Group, so. <laughs> exactly. So I, Spe so I especially people younger than, than you um, probably aren't even on there in a lot of cases. Cool. Know, isn't that crazy? Yeah. It just, <laughs> You know, you can't like do what your parents face. did. Yeah. <laughs> All their parents are on there, so they don't want to be exactly, on there. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, so th this is this is really cool. I've really enjoyed uh, talking to you about this. I've learned a lot. Um, I purposefully, um, I think you remember, I purposefully didn't ask a whole bunch of questions I wanted to ask uh, when we first started talking because I wanted to do it here where we could all learn as a group. And so I've really enjoyed this. I've learned a lot. Sounds like an awesome program. I love the personal touch aspects. Um, it's definitely different. What have I not asked, Nick, that I probably should have asked? Anything else you want to you wanna oh, add in? Man. I mean, oh, man. Have I seen Top Gun Maverick? No. <laughs> well, I mean, who hasn't, really? <laughs> right? How good was that movie? That movie oh, amazing. man. I'm, us I'm using, like, quote, like, when you sign up for our five-day challenge – you know how they give you that example email? So I have uh, maverick at topgun.com as like the example email. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't but even, I, I did not have high expectations of that movie either. And I was blown yeah. away. I loved the original one and I thought, uh, you know, it'll probably be pretty good. But I'm with you, man. That was way beyond my expectations. It was an excellent, excellent movie. Yeah, I've seen it twice and I'm like stoked to see it again. So. Yeah. It was great, but I, I honestly can't think of anything else. You did a great job, and again, I really love your podcast and what the idea was, and I hope you keep doing it. I'm definitely going to keep listening because, I, like I said, I was kind of hooked, and I think I could learn some things that I can tell my students yep. to uh, to do that. I'll, so. I'll definitely keep doing it. In, uh, in fact, 
um, I haven't even announced this yet, but I may, uh, I may be doing the instrument rating here pretty soon and oh. we'll, we'll definitely keep going there. Uh, but I had the idea long, long ago. Um, you, you're going to like this. Um, I, I can tell you like this movie too, um, just from talking to you. Uh, but I had the idea of a, a dread pilot Roberts. So letting other people take over, <laughs> take over <laughs> when they're doing their primary training and adding to right. the episodes as well, because I think there is something special about that, that in cockpit experience, um, that, um, is, is sort of a, um, a mystery for a lot of people when they want to get into flight training or even when they're in flight training, they'd love to hear how another CFI says something, or they'd love to hear the, the problems that I was having or somebody else is having. And you get that in cockpit audio and, and people love the, the interaction with ATC as well. I've heard a lot of feedback from, from listeners that uh, it's a real learning tool to listen to a full flight and all of the communications that, that need to happen uh, during the flight. So for all of those reasons, again, I go back to, you know, audio is, uh, is, is a really important medium, I think for, for learning. Um, even when you take the visuals away, I think there's something extra, uh, with the audio. So, yeah, so I'm hoping that we'll get a lot of diverse content as well as the features like this that I'm that I like doing um, when I visit Oshkosh and hopefully uh, Sun and Fun maybe next year and and uh, get a lot of really cool interviews and discussions with with people all over the industry. I want to keep that in there too. I, I, it's super fun and definitely want to keep it going. Yeah, and hey, maybe because I I definitely want to once I get through all the the lessons on my podcast, I want to have guests. So maybe next year at Oshkosh, you can be on, you can be on part-time. Oh, you podcast. got it, man. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> be happy to. Well, Nick, thanks again. Super fun. Really great product. And best of luck to you. Thanks, Bill. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. I hope you all enjoyed that. Like I said before, if you want to watch these episodes, you can find that on our YouTube channel links in the show notes and on the website. If you want to reach out to me, and I do think you should, my email address is bill at studentpilotcast.com, and my Twitter handle is at BillWill. That's Bravo India Lima Lima Whiskey India Lima. You can also reach out to me on the contact form on the website. That's at studentpilotcast.com. So however you do it with Nick or some other way, keep your head in the game and go learn something about being a pilot. I'll catch you next time. Music for today's episode is To Be an Angel by the Canadian band Uncle Seth. You can get more information and subscribe to the podcast feeds on the web at studentpilotcast.com. Remember, any instruction that you hear in this podcast was meant for me and for me alone in the situation I was in at the time. Please do not try to blindly apply anything you see or hear in this podcast to your own flying without thinking it through on your own completely. If you have questions about any aspect of your flying, please consult a qualified CFI.